what I've done is I've just literally pulled a few different case studies of things that I've done over the last 10 years at the BBC. Um, and uh, I can jump through some of them quicker or, or, or interject if you want to understand more about them. Um, my background was uh, so originally um, I started off in radio and then uh, uh, worked in television. And then about 10 years ago, I started working uh, on interactive television in the UK. Now, interactive television, I'm not sure that it's sort of picked up all over Europe, but at the time, was the only way of doing really interactive narratives uh, around rich media when you're looking back 10 years ago. In the UK, it meant uh, it, it took advantage of the fact that we were uh, broadcasting by satellite, that if you press red button, you could effectively use extra channels to um, distribute video uh, real time, it was streaming, um, and then jump around those videos. So that was where my journey started. So a lot of what I'm talking about is sort of coming at it from the storyteller's point of view rather than from a technology point of view. Um, and then over the last 10 years, I sort of followed that journey until about 2006, 2007, when broadband sort of really came of age and started meaning that the rich media experiences that I was interested in, primarily as a program maker, were now doable on the web. And I think we're now at another stage where that's doable on mobiles, and it will also add an extra dimension with internet connected TV, which I can focus on at the end. Um, <coughs> so I was going to go through um, what, uh, what we've been working on. And I, being in a very old fashioned, linear, traditional media company, um, a lot of what I was doing was trying to evangelize the storytellers that it's not just about uh, having an alternative ending. Lots of producers uh, shunned digital storytelling because they thought it was about making it an, an either or. It was all about choose your ending, and that's not a very satisfactory uh, experience for, for, for many writers, but also for, for many audiences. So I've, I've, I've sort of been going through what we've been doing over the last 10 years, um, and I'll jump into lots of different little case studies. But then what I try to do is categorize some what I think interactive storytelling is about. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily about choosing your own ending. There are lots and lots of flavors of it. And this is what I try to do when I'm talking to either the writers when I'm working on a drama, or the producers, or the traditional documentary, or most recently in children's. In the last three years, I've been working as the head of interactive at children's at the BBC. Um, so, I'll just go back, just give you a little glimpse about why it was so hard um, 10 years ago. And this is what the web looked like in those days when we were trying to promote it on screen, if it would work. So this was a promotion on children's television, I think around 1999. And this is when we first started doing web activities. Programs and the like. Well, we now have a World Wide Web page on the internet. So you can access the information yourself if you can get onto the World Wide Web. Okay, if you can, this is our address. I hope you've got a pen and paper ready because as you can see it's not particularly short. Uh, first of all, to get through to the BBC itself, okay, so get through those walls, uh, you need to type in this first line, http colon, two strokes, www.bbcnc.org.uk. The last, I thought you were. <laughs> so that basically, the first line gets you through to the BBC. Then to get through to the all important children's BBC office and the web, these and next two the lines will do. Oh, I think it's so. gone. There we go. So you can imagine why storytelling, on in interactive storytelling, was rather slow to take off because not only was it a, a tough job to get anything done, the experience for the user when you got there was actually still mostly stills and text. So. Um, the first thing that I did was I was actually using this red button technology which had been invented primarily for covering sports events. So in 2000 the BBC had launched 
an interactive uh, service around Wimbledon, the tennis championship, which allowed you to effectively, while you're watching the Wimbledon uh, tennis championships, flip between different channels, flip between different courts, and watch the court, watch the court of, you, uh, of your choice. So we did this, um, we, took, we piggybacked on that technology, and we did, um, made an interactive version of Walking with Bees. So I come from a documentary uh, background, and this was my first proper attempt into making something which was delivered, as had interactive uh, story narrative. Um, and it used the colour buttons on the bottom of remote control, which allowed you to switch from the, the main story uh, to, you, if you press green, you could have the main story with extra facts on it. Press yellow, you could get a separate version of the programme with the programme reduced to quarter screen, but with scientists talking about, in front of the fossils, talking about the creatures that they knew, that, that you were looking at. And then the making of was about how uh, they created uh, all of these things. So again, in real time, uh, juxtaposed so you could see the, the animatic of this shot or the puppeteers. But what really, uh, and we, we did one other thing which we thought would be quite interesting and it came out of the, the Walking with Dinosaurs series. It provoked quite a lot of interest because it was a very dramatic production. It had a very dramatic commentary from uh, Kenneth Branagh. And this seemed to split audiences. Some loved it, some hated it. So at the last minute, we decided, well, OK, we can, we can also use this technology to provide a different narration for those keen fans. And we, we did what we, we probably made that narration far more scientific than I would have ever done when I was making science documentaries. And you could switch to have a, a, a very well-known voice of science documentaries doing a really hardcore science narration. And this proved incredibly popular. It was sort of one of those things we just added in, we tried it, but it proved incredibly popular. So one of the things I took away from that is that when you're doing, uh, I'll go back, uh, when you're making interactive services, the, one of the key attributes is that you don't actually have to affect the ending, you don't have to affect the narrative. Sometimes it's just about customization. So when broadband came along, we did a similar thing, which was around parenting programming at the BBC. We chopped up 90 hours of parenting program, and we created this little uh, video player. This is back in 2006, pre-YouTube. Um, and the idea was that you could create a, a tailor-made program around your preferences. Let's see if this works. So the idea being that you could um, listen to this and watch the full program through, or you could go in by age, pick the, the age group of your children, let's say you want two to three years, and then dealing with bad behaviour. And you get an introduction. And then when you go into the program, it comes up as an automated storyboard of all the different types of videos. So customization for me became something that we spent a lot of time doing. So I'm just going to get out of that. The second thing that then came along was if you're going to customize it, there's, there's, uh, we made a distinction between what was customizable and what was personalizable. So customizing is putting all of the choice and instructions in the hands of the user, the personalising is then turning that story to actually reflect something back on them. So, you know, the classic example is when you're reading Fifth Bedtime Story and you put, insert their name into it. And that's been around for a long time. There have always been novelty books that you could get with kids' names in it. 
but no one was really doing this in sort of mainstream media. So um, we did a program, another documentary, this one time a prime time program for BBC One about how to sleep better. And this used the same technology but with an extra layers of sort of code in there. So that the promise was we're going to do a 90 minute documentary about how Britain sleeps at night. But if you answer some questions through it, we're going to give you a sleep plan about how you're sleeping and how you can improve your sleep based on um, working with three different universities. Um, and what we found was actually the people who decided to press red stuck with that program a lot longer. We had, a, it, we had six million people watch that program. You could play along with a, with a pen and paper as well. One million press red, which is broke all records at the time. And 98% of those one million were still watching 90 minutes into the show, which is phenomenal in terms of TV. TV figures tend to rely on churn and averages. Ah, curse of my On BBC One, we'll be revealing exclusively what keeps Britain awake at night, explaining why a good night's sleep is so important, and we'll give you a practical guide to improve the quality of your sleep. This is the definitive guide on how to sleep better. So this is just going to jump through various like bits of the show, give you a flavour for it. experienced a sleepless night. It can affect anyone, from very young toddlers to elderly pensioners. But just what is it that turns a good night bad? We invited a hundred self-professed poor sleepers to join us here for a series of tests and experiments. If you didn't sleep, if you did live like you'd like to live, you would conk out. The results of these tests will help us build up a personalized sleep plan for each of the volunteers with real tips and advice to help them sleep better. So, if you want to get the most out of how to sleep better, here's how. During the program, you'll be able to work out your very own sleep profile using a pen and paper. Or, if you're a digital viewer, press red now, and your set-top box will do the work for you. It's free, and you'll get added personalized information throughout the program, specifically relating to your own results. So now, for the last part of our interactive test, you can discover how your lifestyle is affecting your sleep patterns. Again, grab a pen and paper, or if you're a digital viewer, grab your remote, to find out how your work-life balance could be influencing your sleep. Once again, be as truthful as possible to really get the most out of the test. Here's question one. How often do you lie in bed worrying about work or other problems? Jot down A for every day. B at least three or four times a week. C for once or twice a week. Or D for very rarely or never. And if you were doing that Question on the remote two. control, you got exactly How the same, but it was one, drinking. two, three, or four using Again, number Again, jot down A for everything that goes well as they did. So that, that gives you an, an example. And the reason I show it, really, is because, going back to what I said at the start, that most people seem to obsess about being able to influence the narrative. Whereas, actually, one of the things we found is that we were doing a, quite a lot of what we, were, we dubbed in, in the department smoke and mirrors. And it was all about the emotion that you got, the feeling that the story was evolving around you. It didn't matter that my story was very similar to yours, as long as there was that extra little bit of personalization. And then looking at how you can now do that on the web, obviously since 2006, 7 onwards, the rise of broadband tools like Flash allow you to do much more clever things. Um, but it's the 